thanks for joining me today. Uh, it's yeah. just absolutely wonderful to have you. And uh, I heard you got a, an award. Some email came through that uh, some type of a, of an award came through. Yeah, I, I believe it or not, I received two awards last month, and I've got a, an award in February from the Gwinnett Chamber, and um, uh, kind of a humanitarian award. That's fantastic. I mean, it always feels good to get one of those things, and yeah. the pomp and circumstance behind it. Yeah, somebody notice what you're doing. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, it always takes a little while too for that to really to to catch on. So that that's yeah. always a lot of fun. Very good. So how did this all start for you getting into revitalization efforts? Now, for those, I mean, we're global on this. Uh, you're in Lawrenceville, Georgia, which is what it's about. How it's many the minutes? Count, it's the county seat of Gwinnett County, uh, about 20 minutes outside of the center of Atlanta. Oh, wow. And and I am uh, Gwinnett based. I uh, have done a, a lot of real estate projects here and around Atlanta um, and and um, and have had a, a great career there and uh, also manage community improvement districts, which are uh, set up when a group of property owners come together and agree to pay an extra tax to improve their area. So yeah. I set up a couple of them and and now manage two. So that's that's kind of my day job now and um in uh last spring i was wanting to do something to help the ukrainian people and i had been to ukraine in 1998 as, as part of my goal of visiting every country in the world and i really liked the ukrainian people and was really impressed with how they love their freedom they were uh, just out from under the Soviet Union, and uh, they didn't want to be stuck back in that communist regime. They they liked being independent and and valued that tremendously. So I never forgot that. Uh, they were invaded in 2014, and and not a whole lot of active. Not no nobody really said anything, and Russia chipped off a couple pieces of Ukraine and got away with it and obviously thought they could do that again and just take over the whole country and and attempted to begin doing that on February 24th of this of 2022 last year and uh I really uh became became activated with that I I just said I want to do something more than just pray or talk or or write a check and send it to some charity I want to get involved and help these people and I don't have any other, I, at that time, I didn't have any other connection to uh, people in Ukraine or the country of Ukraine other than just wanting to help them. The, um, uh, I, I had sent a couple checks to different charities, and uh, then I literally prayed about it, and, and I, I basically said, I want to do something, give me a mission. And, and that day, uh, the head of FODAC, which stands for Friends of Disabled Adults and Children, uh, the head of that organization, Chris Brand, uh, they're based in Tucker, and I serve on their advisory board, uh, asked if I would be willing to accompany a shipment of medical equipment into Ukraine. Uh, I hadn't really planned on going into Ukraine at the time, being under attack from Russia, but uh, I just said yes. I felt like there was a reason that uh, he was asking me, and and I felt like it was the right thing to do. So I uh, basically went to Romania in uh, the beginning of June of 2022, a little over six months ago, and uh, met with a number of Rotary folks. In fact, just some background on that shipment. Um there was a uh, Rotarian by the name of Radu Zunovu in the Buckhead Rotary Club who uh, who grew up in Romania and now lives in the Atlanta area. And, and his father, Radu Sr., is still in Romania. And his father, in fact, is a physician. Uh, the two of them said they wanted to do something. Radu Sr. has 
medical contacts in Ukraine and had been receiving requests for medical equipment, Radu Sr. and Radu Jr. decided to raise money among the Atlanta area Rotary Clubs in March and raised well over $150,000 to buy medical equipment to supply these hospitals that were damaged by the Russian invasion. Mm. Uh, the Rotary Clubs had been working in the past with FODAC. FODAC basically uh, collects medical equipment for people with disabilities and ships it, delivers it to people with disabilities. And they deliver to people with disabilities, not just in the metro Atlanta area, but all over the country and now all over the world. Mm. And they had a great reputation for, for getting needed equipment to people in tough situations it, it, on a fast, efficient basis. So the Rotary folks asked Chris Brand, also coincidentally a Rotarian, uh, to buy the medical equipment, palletize it, warehouse it, organize it for shipment, and arrange for shipment over to Romania. And then from Romania, it was escorted in. It, they are these shipments are escorted into Ukraine across the Romania-Ukrainian border. I went with their second shipment, which left in early June. I left in early June, and and while that shipment was on its way on on Delta to uh, Munich and then trucked over to Romania, I, I had flown to Romania, met with a number of of Romanian officials about the Ukraine efforts and uh, then uh, was driven across the border from Romania into Ukraine by two Rotary president women. Uh, and it, I called them my bodyguards. Basically, men were not allowed to leave the country. Right. Women could come and go. So they care. They took me into Ukraine and, and I for a couple of days, worked in their operation, uh, distributing food and supplies to refugees. Some background on the refugees. Yeah. Ukraine had 41 million people at the beginning of the war, a population of 41 million. Roughly 5 million of those totally left the country of Ukraine. They went to surrounding countries and... Uh, over 100,000, uh, in fact, over 130,000 are now actually in the United States. So, so they left the country of Ukraine. And then another five or 6,000 Ukrainian folks went from the parts of Ukraine under attack to the safer parts. The part under attack is the east, and the safer part over next to Poland is the west. And, and then uh, the South to some extent next to Romania. So um, there were uh, uh, 5 million refugees and there still are 5 million internal displaced persons in, in, in the rest of Ukraine that are being taken care of by uh, all kinds of different charitable organizations, including Rotary. Mm. I was there with... Uh, the Rotarians in Chernovisti, Ukraine, and, and we were handing out uh, food and all kinds of other supplies. These were mostly women with children. Uh, in fact, I was handing out a lot of diapers, and as a grandfather, I really understand the importance of disposable diapers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we, it we was, need those. Yes, it was, it was um, just something I never... Uh, dreamed I'd ever be doing, but there I was, and air raid sirens were going off, and, and we were serving all of these people, and I really, uh, it affected me, and I, uh, in my luggage, I had a, a lot of surgical equipment with me, in addition to what we had shipped over on Delta. We shipped over 37 pallets. I had some very expensive surgical drills with me, worth probably twenty or $30,000 in my luggage. And so after I, I had delivered, after I was working with the Rotary Clubs there in Chernovisti, giving out the food and supplies, 
I, I took an overnight train north to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, and went to their main hospital and met with their surgeons and um, delivered the surgical equipment to the lead surgeon at the main hospital in Kiev. In fact, I, I was with uh, four or five surgeons outside of their operating department, and I think all of us had tears in our eyes. Uh, these these surgical drills, there are striker surgical drills, something I never heard of before, and they are battery operated. They're used throughout the world so that a surgeon doesn't have to have a, a drill with a wire attached to it as he's working on your leg or your backbone or your elbow. Um, the doctors there were experiencing a lot of shrapnel wounds. I mean, the, the people they were taking care of were experiencing a lot of shrapnel wounds. And, and uh, until they had this kind of equipment, uh, in a lot of cases, they were amputating. So instead of putting your arm or leg back together, it was just, do we amputate above or below the knee or the elbow? Yeah. And so surgical drills allowed them to piece back together the bones in your arm or leg and, and get you back in one piece and back on your job. And they were basically taking care of uh, soldiers, but they were also taking care of a lot of civilians. I mean, if, as you've read, the uh, civilians have taken the brunt of the Russian attack, bombs going off in playgrounds and school through schools throughout the country. Yeah. And now it's Iranian made drones. And now it's ama- Iranian made drones. Yes. Wow. So, so I, 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 Delivered the equipment to the hospital there in Kiev, went over to uh, Cherkasy, uh, close to the front, met with uh, the the lead doctor that is coordinating a lot of their efforts. Her name is Ola Palachuk, and I call her Florence Nightingale. Mm. She's 24-7 coordinating hospital efforts and getting them the supplies that they need. Um I went to her hospital and a couple other hospitals in that city near the front, um, saw some military folks that were there getting taken care of, and, and then back to Kiev and then back to the western part of the country where I met with a number of rotary leaders and other leaders from Ukraine. Um, in fact, I was the only American there and spoke to them on, on behalf of our country, telling them, and I promised them that we were going to back them all the way, and and I was going to come back and do what I could to to build an effort to continue supporting them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, 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 I really there. wonder about that. Yeah, I wonder how how were you like during this is during war. What kind of preparations did you take, just knowing that anything could happen at any minute? You're ready to go into a, a, a safe position in case something was incoming from Russia. Um. I was in three different cities with air raid sirens going off. And at that time, it was hard for them to predict where missiles were going. So, I mean, if a missile, if a missile was coming in from a Russian ship uh, into Ukraine, they they couldn't tell where it was going. So any place that was vulnerable to missiles had air raid sirens going. So you never really knew whether a missile was going to hit your particular town or, or, or your particular building, um, it, but they were prepared. Now they've, they've honed that down and gotten a lot more uh, accurate on, on how they handle the missiles, uh, as, as you've heard. I mean, in fact, they've now got a lot of defensive equipment that allows them to shoot down the majority of the missiles. Um, I, uh, I, 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 the only thing I did was get a tetanus shot before I went. Ukraine is a a first world country and Mm. they are technically capable. It's a safe country uh, other than the Russian invasion. It's a pretty (laughs) safe place to go. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful architecture too. I always marvel at that every time I'm seeing live shots uh, from that area. Yes. Tremendous. Tremendous. And, um, uh, the people in the United States don't really, they're not aware of how advanced Ukraine is. And um, they, they were, they're, they're determined to win this thing. Um, finishing up my, my trip last 
last June, I, I basically um, finished meeting with the leaders there in, in Western Ukraine, went back to Romania and met a tractor trailer that was actually had this banner in back of me on the front of the tractor trailer. And uh, we drove that tractor trailer into a rotary warehouse in Uzerod, Ukraine, where we offloaded the 37 pallets, 12,000 pounds. And, um, and, and from there, from that warehouse, the, the shipment was distributed to 14 different hospitals, including three at the front. And it was all kinds of, uh, it was medical, it was a surgical drill equipment that I described earlier, as well as um, catheters, breathing supplies, and a lot of wound care management. Things you, you don't really think about, but all of things that are used by a hospital to take care of somebody injured. Mm -hmm. uh, I came back from Ukraine in June and, and, and began talking to Chris Brand at, at FODAC that I mentioned earlier and, and, and then created HelpingUkraine.us, which is a nonprofit mm -hmm. with a 501c3 fund status that allows people to make to make contributions to us that are tax deductible, which is important to a lot of large donors. And, and then we are very organized in how we handle that money coming in. Um, we worked to build the organization last summer and uh, began receiving funds and, and buying ongoing medical equipment going over to the hospitals in Ukraine. We've sent a, a couple shipments since then that are distributed by primarily Rotarians throughout Ukraine. And, and then in November, uh, we, we had the blessing to get connected to Ken Ward, who was working with some churches based in Odessa and, and Moldova to, to get uh, stoves and, and, and blankets to the uh, civilians that were actually there at the front in areas that the Russians left. And when the Russians were pushed out near Kherson, Ukraine, and, and Ken basically needed support financially so that he could do what he was doing. And we clicked. Uh, it was just amazing. Uh, he, he is determined to be there and help the Ukrainian people who are there near the front. And so he is coordinating teams of installers there in the Kherson and Mykolaiv area. But again, this is an area where the Russians had taken and then were pushed out by the Ukrainians about a month and a half ago. Yeah. Leaving behind a lot of houses missing a wall because it got blown off. Uh, and a lot of older people who are not going to move from their house, they, they're going to die or they're going to stay there and live, but they're, they're not going to be a refugee. They're staying there and, and they're in many cases without heat and without water. Uh, the, the wells over there have, have electric, electrical pumps that pump the water out of the ground and then pump it onto houses. So we are uh, setting up generators to man to run these pumps, and then we are setting up wood burning stoves to um, keep these people warm. Trying to set up a wood burning stove in every neighborhood. Uh, again, these people were on natural gas for the most part, which has totally stopped, and and they have yeah. electricity, and and so they're they're cold. It's fourteen degrees there today. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. The worst time, of course, that's when the war started. Exactly. And when, you know, when yes. they're vulnerable. Yes. And, and Putin's basically doing his best to, to demoralize them, but they are determined. And, and they, I think every missile that hits Ukraine increases their determination. It's like, we're not giving up. We're going to die or we're going to win, but we're not giving up. So yeah. Ken is basically distributing uh, thousands of blankets, uh, dozens of generators, and, and having installers install wood-burning stoves. And, and he's over there now with his team 
and they're actively working this forward. Our goal is to expand that effort uh, to uh, try to take care of the people who are in areas where the Russians were in control and, and then are, are now on their own without any utilities and, and help them as hopefully the Russians are pushed back further. Yeah, Kherson. I mean, I saw the aftermath there of uh, yes. that that war in yes. that area. Wow, just compelling. Yes, chilling. Yes, in fact, Ken basically, Kherson uh, was was hit hard last week, and I said, Ken, are you sure you want to go there? And he said, This is what God wants me to do, yeah. and this is where I'm going to be. Yeah, it that's, is. It's that's a higher where call. he is today. Mm. Gosh, did you ever think, like, when you got into this, like, you know, all, no. you know, half a century ago, did you ever think you'd be involved in doing something like this? You were so local here in the I, greater Atlanta area. When I was there giving out the food and meeting with the doctors and the air raid sirens going, I felt like I was in some kind of a movie. I, I never would have dreamed that I would be there in a war place and, and be helping like that. And um Sending Ken off on Wednesday, that feeling came back strong. I mean, he was literally going to the war zone this week, today, to to help people, and and we're here supporting him every way we can support him. I I think about it twenty four seven. Um, yesterday we I received a request from a group in outside of Kiev that um is is trying to get a hospital back on track where the power system keeps getting bombed. They, they, their electricity is not reliable. They're, they they had $20,000 raised for a $25,000 generator to power this hospital, and they needed five grand quick. And after talking to them and checking them out, I said, well, why are you the five grand next week? And that five grand is on the way. So I, I'm 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 honored to be able to help people like that and to now have the resources from our incredibly generous donors to help them. Yeah, you're using your experience because you've revitalized places. You're doing yes. it over in Ukraine and you're perfect with that. <laughs> yes, yes. But it's a it's a much bigger sense of urgency. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're actually uh we're 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 helping people this month that will free, will be dead in two months if we don't help them. And, and so there, there's a strong sense of urgency. Unlike the real estate business, it kind of plods along uh, here. I mean, if if we're not effective, people will die. Oh, that, true. That that's, my, yeah. that's what keeps me running 24-7 to, to get them what they need and to keep our team motivated. Not that they need motivation. They're all really psyched to be helping and doing this and yeah so, yeah all these generators i was just thinking about yeah. this about the generators uh are they getting fuel in how are they getting the fuel for these since natural actually, gases believe it or not ukraine produces some fuel so yeah. initially when i was there in june last year fuel was a huge problem and and i mean you, we before we left for anywhere we'd have a couple five gallon jugs of of gas in the back of the van just to make sure we could get where we needed to go. Um, they don't have electricity to pump fuel out of tanks right now in some places, but they do have that resource and, and, and fuel for generators is available. That's very good. Very important yes. as well, since these yes. uh, power grids keep getting knocked out. And uh, how is Chernobyl doing these days? Gosh, you heard a little bit about this yes. uh, towards the beginning. The Russians yeah. basically invaded Chernobyl and, and dug in there. And, and I've read that the Russians that dug in there now, many of them are dying from radiation poisoning because they they dug into radioactive soil that's going to mm. radioactive for decades to come and um they just didn't know what they were doing and uh with with some of the other areas like zaporizhia the other big nuclear plant we we hope that the russians don't mess that up i mean because it's uh, messing up a nuclear plant like that is 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 a is centuries worth of damage not not just to the people today 
but to future generations. Mm, mm, mm. So you did like, <laughs> yeah, you had to go by truck every time because the railroad yes. gauges I was reading are a little bit different than what well, we have in the U.S. And that's a, that's a good question. Basically, there first of all, there's no flights into Ukraine. Uh, any any there's no no public flights available or for shipment or for people everything is by truck uh trains in in the communist bloc were a different gauge than planes in in the west like the united states and in germany and so forth so i mean you the train goes up to the border and then you look at the track on the other side of the border mm. and, it, and it's literally about a foot wider on on each side and 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 I I saw it myself. I wish I had taken a picture of it. It's just right. amazing that that they don't connect. So the only way you can get things in is by tractor trailer, and and there are thousands of tractor trailers every day crossing that border back and forth, bringing supplies in, and they are um, all kinds of volunteer groups plus regular businesses. Uh, it, it, one thing that's not known to people and not understood is is basically half of Ukraine is still functioning. I mean, the, the part that's not currently at the war front, they're they're still producing whatever they were producing, and and they the farms are still harvesting crops and all kinds of other activities are still ongoing. I mean, you you can go into a restaurant on the western side of the country. And, and buy a nice dinner if you if or or a, or a beer that's hard to believe yeah so i mean the american yeah. public which is not thinking about them I mean, they're thinking more domestically uh so they i mean yeah. a lot of people have to understand that how you know it's it's more modern than you think correct it, it's it, well in in the um and, and it's about two-thirds of ukraine is is functioning relatively normally now i mean their government has is stretched to the limits with manpower and finances but thanks to the u.s and other countries around the world uh everything keeps moving forward and and we need to keep supporting them uh speaking of functioning the rotary clubs in ukraine are amazing um i i met with the presidents of the 65 the 65 rotary clubs last june face to face and um, those Rotary Clubs are, are the backbone of a lot of the humanitarian effort coming in. A, a Rotary Club here, here in Atlanta can raise money and, and, and have uh, FODAC organize stuff and ship stuff over and, and know that the Rotary folks over there are, are not going to have any theft or slippage. They're, they're going to get those that surgical equipment or those hospital supplies where they need to go. And, mm. and there's, and it's very organized. So Rotary has been a huge help over there and um, worldwide. I, when I was in these warehouses, I saw pallets that had come in from Rotary clubs all over the world. Mm. And, mm. and it's been just a huge unified effort and it's ongoing and, I mean, it'd be nice if the war was over tomorrow, but most of us are are ready to to just keep going as long as it takes. Yeah, yeah. And we don't see an end in sight, but who knows? It, it's... I, I I think things will. I think it will start wrapping up this spring or summer. Uh, I, I everything I read and the reports I get are that the Russians are starting to fall apart pretty badly, and the Ukrainians they're, they're as motivated as ever. And they're not giving up. Yeah, there's got to be some type of a solution. It seems like maybe they would be happy if they just kept those areas on the border that they were mainly Russians uh, are anyway right now. I, I, I've, I've read a lot of history about this. Basically, those areas on the border where Russians are right now anyway, for the most part, Stalin in the 30s uh, had a had had a mass uh, famine that that he basically organized with the intention of of wiping out the Ukrainian people and then repopulating the very rich farmland in Ukraine with with Russians 
Yeah. I mean, over over the last uh, 80 years, they they Russia has continued through all kinds of different things, eliminating Ukrainians and, and replacing them with Russians. And that that includes the Crimea. OK, the Crimea. Right. You know, people say it's largely Russian. Well, it's largely Russian because they either ran out the Ukrainians or they killed the Ukrainians and moved in Russians. And and so the, the Ukrainians recognize that you, you, you shouldn't be able to take over land by, by killing the people that are there and moving in your people. Um, that's the way it was done in, in history, but it's not the way that things happen now. So the Ukrainians are not going to give up on that land that Russia got in 2014. Their their goal is to get the Russians completely out of Ukraine territory. Yeah, that was just like really they they try to slip under the radar and they're slowly trying to take it over and uh yeah, yes. if they could fight. That's that's good. Yes. That's really really good. Wow. Anyway, so, so you got into this. Uh, you went to Emory University. Emory went yes. to Emory. Emory went to Emory uh, and then went on to Wharton and got an MBA in finance. But I I fell in love with Atlanta. I'm originally from Baltimore. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Atlanta is the only huh. place I wanted to be. And I, I, I'm glad I'm here. I, I had no prior connection, but have done pretty well and, and really like the the mentality here in Atlanta where we welcome everybody and and get help get people on track. And if you're willing to work and treat people right, you can really go places in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. Coming. I mean, that's why so many of us uh, have come here because just the <laughs> opportunities that. Yes. Yeah. And that, that goes for all kinds of people, not just white guys, but anybody. I mean, oh, black, yeah. Hispanic, anybody can come here. And, and thrive all you got to do is work hard and treat people right yeah that is that is the absolute truth that's what makes it so yes. great definitely yes. yes do you have a lot of people here i think uh probably one of our biggest challenges is water uh have you i remember that uh the yes. drought in 2007 that was a little scary do you think we could face that in the future i think that um I, I don't know the weather. The weather patterns that I see show that it that our our area will continue doing well, unlike people on the West Coast or or the Midwest. I, I think we 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 will do okay on water, and and I think the governments here are doing a good job trying to conserve water and plan ahead. So yeah. we're not going to be snagged like some of the states out west where the the reservoirs are going dry yeah scary what's out there uh some of those lakes yeah almost yes. totally dried out so yeah yes. that's just something to look at and to plan ahead and hopefully we you know invest more in that infrastructure and reservoirs and things like that yes yes so hopefully yeah well i just yeah. saw so many changes here over you know three and a half decades here and you think you know the south just has that um just has that that stereotype but Atlanta is so modern and I I've seen it take off. Yeah. I've been here three and a half decades. It's just amazing. Yes, it is. Good place to be. Yeah. Can you believe like long ago, it was like, it was a, like a huge deal to get on a train. I, I believe to go from Atlanta to Lawrenceville. Wow. That was yes. like, I can't even imagine <laughs> that kind of feeling. Yep. Agreed. Gosh, yep. it's, it's yes. definitely come a long way. There, there's come no a long question. Way. On. And and I mean they've we've made mistakes over the years. I mean we should have had a much better transportation system here, uh, and and we're now paying the price for not being well organized. Um, but we 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 there we're we're trying to catch up. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, kind of like what happened. Subject. <laughs> you know, happened out in Los Angeles where it's just like you know you're a victim of your own success, but yes. you know far as moving people around uh yeah that's that's a huge challenge i i would love to see like marta just go beyond marta's the uh mass transit here to go beyond doraville go beyond jimmy carter boulevard come up your way up 316 that would be a dream but you know each track is like what a two million bucks or something like that 
Well, and I, I don't know how much you want to talk about it, but I'm intimately involved with it. Um, oh, good. There, there, it's there, interesting. There will be an election next year for Gwinnett to join MARTA. Uh, it, it has failed three times. It would have passed in 2020 if not for the pandemic. But I anticipate that in 2024, Gwinnett will vote to join MARTA. Then there will be a line from the Doraville MARTA train station out to the OFS site, which is in the center of the Gateway 85 Community Improvement District that I happen to manage. And our plan is for that line to then go north parallel to I-85 to Gwinnett Place Mall and, and the arena on Sugarloaf Parkway. And, and then also have a line go from the OFS site along Jimmy Carter Boulevard and Mountain Industrial. Not sure how much you want to get into local stuff like that, but yeah. uh, we we will catch up and, and get tuned in and, and be able to have Gwinnett connect to the rest of the civilized world. Yeah. And like we were saying, Gwinnett County is easily 30 minutes north of Atlanta yes. for those who are not familiar with this area, but it's all connected in. MARTA is the system that is part of Fulton County where Atlanta is and DeKalb County. Gwinnett County sure. traditionally has been the outlier and didn't really want any mass transit all these years. I remember all these votes going way, way back yep. and just getting shot down every time. Now, Atlanta's got even worse traffic. The pandemic's over. We're back to where we were on that. And uh, yes, yeah, we got to make some choices here. The The election in 2020 would have passed with, with us uh, having transit in Gwinnett, but the pandemic uh, messed us up. If you recall, everything was shut down in the summer of 2020 and going into the fall. And uh, the the roads were empty. People weren't going to work. People weren't going out to eat. And and so uh, people said, well, the roads are wide open. Why, why do we need to worry about transit? And, right. and so it failed by a hair because people couldn't figure out why we we're talking about transit when, when the roads were wide open. Yeah. That'll be different next year. Yeah. I, I just, uh, I'm just amazed at how, uh, much progress has happened in this county and uh, i'm in peachtree corners one of the okay. newer cities in this yes. <laughs> county actually yes. the biggest population wise i would think it's got more people than lawrenceville but uh yeah there i mean it's i've seen tremendous uh building and change and what what a story it is over here uh gwinnett has uh, I, I moved here in the 80s and and it's just been amazing how fast it's grown and yeah. just uh and and really good people and and that same kind of opportunity that we were talking about early, earlier. Yeah, and that whole mall culture. I when I first came here, uh, Gwinnett Place Mall, which was yes. in, in, near Lawrenceville, it, or Duluth, is uh, pretty much just like malls all across the country. So it's just not uh, not just Atlanta, but uh, we have to reimagine these things, and yes. uh, that's in dire need of redevelopment. Yes, and and. Uh, and it's being redeveloped. Uh, I mentioned that I manage community improvement districts, and, and there are 35 community improvement districts in Metro Atlanta, uh, five of which I started, believe it or not. The, the Gwinnett Place CID is, is uh, developing plans right now to rework that entire closed-up mall into something that will be a really vibrant uh, mixed-use development. And and that's that's coming, coming pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. And we have so few east west corridors in the Atlanta metro yes. area. So Pleasant Hill, where the uh mall has been located all these years, uh is just a traffic nightmare. So we're trying to figure out ways of getting out of that and hopefully relieving it, starting with that diverging diamond that goes to I-85. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Diverging yeah. diamond is uh, getting well. I mean, I don't. I'm not, I'm not sure. There, there's diverging diamonds, which is what Jimmy Carter and Pleasant Hill used to cross 85, uh, and and uh, the one that is Jimmy Carter's is is it, we're working to replace that with something with much more capacity. The diverging diamond was a great improvement, but even now that is 
way over capacity. Yeah, I could tell. Yeah, because when you get to the intersection, it's like, wait yes. a minute, now I'm going to get stuck here. Yes. <laughs> Your car is yep. coming off the freeway. It's like, I can't get out of the way. It's just, uh, yes. yeah, it needs to be updated. It's so many people yes. coming here. Yeah, yep. agreed. Agreed. Definitely. Wow. Just yes. love coming down to downtown Lawrenceville. Everybody try to come and visit. Speaking for the uh, CVB over there. Uh, yes. There's a theater building. It's beautiful. Gosh, this this theater where a lot of productions are being staged. Yes. It's just gorgeous. The, the Aurora Theater. Uh, I brought the Aurora Theater in in 2004. And um, the city of Lawrenceville was a great partner on that. And, and then recently, the Aurora Theater uh merged or or grew into the Lawrenceville Arts Center uh with a 35 million dollar new facility and and uh Janet and I were actually there New Year's Eve and and they are really going strong really great group of people there and and the city is incredibly supportive it's a win win for everybody mm. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. yeah yeah, yeah. Well, it's been fantastic speaking with you. I uh, first met you at one of those Tom Houck gatherings. And for those who uh, don't know, Tom Houck was uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s driver back yes. in the 60s. He came from Boston. Yeah. And Tom yes. had a radio show, I believe, for a little while. <laughs> yes. The yes. WGST. Yes. He, he he never slows down and, and is a, a really great spirit in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. He used Last to be on a... The last time I was with um, John Lewis was yeah. at Tom Houck's birthday party probably five years ago. Yeah, I was at that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was nice to see John Lewis one last time. He yes. Was, uh, really, really nice. Wow. Yes. Yeah, John Lewis, another legend. Uh, so many here. Yes, and, that's for sure. <laughs> gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for all your work in Ukraine. I kind of have ties there. My grandfather came from a little village, probably closer to Belarus. Uh, I believe it's called Kupel. And okay. I was reading up on that. And wow. uh, that, that professor from Boston, uh, Noam Chomsky, I think his father came from that village. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah. Small okay. world. Small world. Now, have you been back there? Have you ever been there? No, oh, no. I know people who have. I've been in the news business for uh, almost 35 years now. Okay. Uh, I know people who have spent time covering uh, the war going back and forth. So, you know, people who have described to me what's going on there. Yeah, it's. Uh, I do a lot of work here in Atlanta, video-wise, with that. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. Well, you need to be staying on top of it and... Absolutely. It, my goal is to help them build a, a tourism industry when this war is over. Uh, I was just, I, the, it's a beautiful country with great people. Uh, they've got good infrastructure. I mean, they it, a, a quarter of it's gotten bombed pretty bad, but I think it'll come back pretty strong. And, and I think people will want to go see where the war was and, and the results of the war but then also see a country recovering from the war, you know, just like Germany and Japan recovered with the Marshall plan. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think that's going to happen with Ukraine, hopefully soon. Yes. That is a, you know, it's a great idea to, uh, yep. to start a tourism industry once uh, everything comes back. And yes. uh, yeah, we think yes. about them all the time and, you know, it's important for Americans and the rest of the world to really understand that. And, uh, yeah, I caught that speech in Congress uh, when President Zelensky came. Oh in. my gosh! What a what? Without him, they they would have fallen apart fast. Yeah, everybody mm. expected them to fall apart fast. Mm. But he really the 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 spirit there is 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 so strong, and they're so unified, and and it's like we will do whatever it takes. Just tell me what to do. Yeah. And, and they're all men and women and children. They're all on the same page. And that, and I wish we were like that. Yeah. <laughs> very, very rough right now. And yes. uh, by the time I post this, uh, I guess hopefully we'll have some type of a speaker in Washington and, uh, 
things will look a little bit better and it, maybe a little bit more unified. You could only be an optimist, right? Wouldn't it be nice if people actually work together there? Yeah, yeah. There are, you know, there are some, and I, I'm pretty optimistic people will start reaching across the aisle a little bit more, especially in all of our state houses. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, this divisiveness will fade pretty yep. quick. Agreed. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, Thank you very much. Maybe I'll see you at a future Tom Hawk gathering. Uh, yes. Or something yeah, like that. I enjoyed that. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Good. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care and best wishes in all of your thank endeavors. You. Well, likewise. Sing out if I can do anything for you on any front. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.